Um, Plato's Republic, in my view, is the most important book of the Western tradition, and it certainly deserves consideration as uh, the greatest example of putting ink on paper. I know there are lots of other possibilities as well, but Plato, and particularly Plato's Republic, would be my uh, my my choice uh, for such a distinction. Um, we're going to read Plato very slowly, which is the way he deserves to be read. And I'm working on the assumption that you've already read it once, quick and dirty. All right. Of course, you don't understand much of what's going on. That's not a problem. That's the idea. So if you intend to uh, come along with us on this trip, I think you'll find it amazing because uh, Plato's Republic is an extraordinary intellectual achievement, and it's also an extraordinary work of art. So uh, in order to make sense of Plato's Republic, though, you need to read at a very minimum uh, close to a dozen other Greek texts. I know that that's uh, daunting, but if you don't know the context that Plato is working in, then you're really missing a large part of uh, what is required to develop an adequate understanding of the of the dialogues. Uh, I'm I've been reading the Republic for a very long time, and uh, I come back to it like an old friend. But it's also uh, it's also full of mysteries and unknowns too. Uh, recently, it's. Uh, scholars made the argument that there's a series of musical compositions buried in the Republic and in other dialogues. And for all I know, that may be the case. I'll show you a different set of things buried in it. And in order to do that, I'm going to need to have you read some outside material that's excellent on its own right, in its own right. But we're going to be reading them specifically so we understand what Plato's driving at. Now, the outside reading for today was the pre-Socratics. And the pre-Socratics uh, are a kind of intellectual mutation. It's a new way of thinking about nature, and it is an adaptive mutation. It, uh, it is advantageous in many ways. But in addition to being advantageous, it is also uh, dangerous, and it is also potentially... Uh, uh, more of a hazard than it's worth. And since I have a very high regard of science, uh, for me to say that uh, it creates problems that may vitiate the advantages that come with it, I'll try and make good on that. But I'm not trying to denigrate science in any way. But the big argument that I'm going to be making is that all scientific revolutions always generate a corresponding revolution in the human sciences. And that's what Plato is doing. Uh, various Greek writers have been contributing to this transformation, but Plato is back is is uh, batting cleanup, as they say in baseball. And here he is, about three eighty or three seventy five BC, and he's back in Athens, and the place is to a great extent a a ruin. Uh, much has been destroyed and lost. Uh, since the end of the Peloponnesian War, where uh, the Athenians outsmarted themselves and the Spartans ended up winning. So about 600 BC, we get the world's first scientific revolution. Now, it happens in Ionia, which are the islands between Turkey and Greece, and uh, they are close enough to have very direct contact both with Egypt and Mesopotamia, all right? So this is a very advantageous location. <clears throat> the islands of Ionia are trading cities for the most part. Uh, they get a large commerce, both in goods and in ideas. And so they're very cosmopolitan places. And yet uh, they also have access to the accumulated information and the accumulated uh, intellectual achievements of at least two of the great river valley civilizations. Now, 
the Egyptians offer them various insights into various traditions, and uh, the Mesopotamians do too. Much of this overlaps, but uh, not all of it does. What the ancient River Valley civilizations had, like all other uh, human beings prior to the first scientific revolution, which I'm talking about here, um, everybody believes in spooks and spirits and things that go bump in the night. So that, call that myth physics. All right. Now, what the Greeks do, or these Ionians do, when they turn the corner from that tradition, is criticize poetic myths. And instead, they try and explain the world in a purely mechanical, purely causal, and impersonal way. So what the early Greek scientists, the early Greek physicists did was make a breakthrough by asking a new question, a better question. And a new better question is worth a dozen new better answers. And the new question they're asking is, instead of who did that, speaking about thunder or lightning, and they changed the question to what did that? In other words, they stopped personifying the forces of nature. They were just dumb rocks, essentially, or as they would work it out eventually, they were matter and matter turned out to be uh, uh, encountered in various phases. And uh, they're eventually gonna work out atomism too, the idea of a minimal unit of matter can't be broken up. So um, the first of the physicists is Thales, he says, all is water. Now that sounds unimpressive. And yeah, in some ways it is, but you have to remember he says, doesn't have a vocabulary already established for the things he's trying to talk about. In this case, I think he's trying to talk about the phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And that's the only thing that Thales knew that would naturally appear in all three forms. So he drew the inference that there's a substratum of well, he doesn't have a word for it yet, but matter. And uh, this matter inheres in all the different uh, manifestations, the different states of matter. And he adds to that the idea of energy, right? Which is fire, principle of transformation. So um, Thales thinks all is water. And Aximander, he encounters and is trying to discuss the unbounded, uh, remember that he's sketching out new fundamental ideas that haven't been sketched out before. Imagine trying to explain to a group of people that did not have a word or a concept for such a thing, what time is, or what space is, or what matter is. Uh, imagine trying to explain space, you know, space. And when they look at you like you're crazy because you're not really gesturing at anything, uh, it's very hard to make that conceptual jump to where the idea is that I'm pointing to the nothing. That's the space. And uh, matter and causality and uh, uh, energy, um, all of these new ideas are being manufactured. And that's very hard work to uh, coin new ideas and new terms. And that reflects a new understanding of the world. It's impersonal, it's uh, not poetic, it's empirical, and it, uh, it is more effective in manipulating nature because it eliminates uh, a whole bunch of useless spooks and spirits and things that don't uh, exist in the real world. Uh, the last of these three is Anaximenes. He comes up with the idea that everything is air. And the reason why is that he's decided that matter uh, exists in denser and, le and less dense, more rarefied forms. Uh, he looks at a fire, watches energy, which is flame, uh, consume the log, and it gives off smoke. Most of the log disappears, although there is some ash left. But the when you subtract the ash from what the log was to begin with, the rest of that is wood that's been turned into air. 
So what, do they, what it means is, is that all is air because air is the most thinly dense thing, the, the, the most rarefied. And when you pack air together sufficiently, you get liquids. And then you pack the liquids together, you get solids. It's an interesting idea. And you have to remember that he doesn't have a set of ideas with which to immediately refer. So explaining these things to people are very difficult. Now, as this new uh, empirical and uh, non-mythological physics becomes an important part of intellectual life, it develops in a number of important uh, ways, in a number of important directions, all of which will be important for the development of Greek and Western thought more generally. Um, in this tradition, we have uh, uh, a polymath, I guess it would be the best way to call him. He was a, a poet and a scientist and a mystic, and uh, uh, his name was Empedocles. And what he did was he came up with a, a structure for, uh, for what? Uh, for uh, the elements in nature. He's the one who introduces the idea of elements. And what it is, if you were to just put a cross, like a plus sign on your on a piece of paper or a whiteboard, it would be er e, earth, air, fire, water. And so what have we there? We have fire, which is energy, the principle of transformation. That's the stuff that allows everything else when fire mixes with it to turn into something else. Think about fire mixing with solid wood and turning into uh, smoke, which is a kind of uh, air made of wood. Okay. So um, earth, air, fire, and water. Uh, nowadays, we don't view fire as an element, but rather a process of oxidation. But uh, he's making a start in distinguishing between the various manifestations of matter and trying to find a way to account for how one can turn into the other. Right. For example, if something is rock, how is it possible that if you impose enough heat on it, the rock melts and it yields things like copper ore? Well, then it's not really rock anymore. Or the rock itself has been transformed. The idea of transformation and change is going to turn out to be a very vexing problem for the kind of uh, science they're producing. Finally, the last of the, oh, oh yeah, oh, just before I go to the next one, um, Empedocles, Earth, Air, Fire, and Water is the first draft of what will eventually become the periodic table of the elements, All right? So that's where it starts. Democritus, you know, the next really centrally important figure, we don't have his writings, but we have people speaking about him. He is the one who introduces, along with Leucippus, the idea of an atom, which is an individual, indiv indivisible, minimal unit of matter. And he thinks that there's this, you know, this is like Legos. They're all the same size. They're all the same shape. They all pack together in the same way. And they're so small, you can't see them. They're very, very, very small. They're so small that no knife can cut them. Nothing can cut them. So, uh, this is going to lead, uh, lead to a world in which we've taken the elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and then attributed them to something simpler still, which is matter, right, made up of atoms. And the atoms are organized or modified in some way to give us earth, air, fire, and water. But they all are reducible to some atomic arrangement. And this is actually a very interesting and very handy idea. Uh, ex extending this, say, as Hippocrates does uh, in the Hippocratic School, um, they came up with a theory of perception. Uh, the reason why pepper tastes so hot and it's uh, it kind of burns your tongue is because hot foods like that, like pepper, um, they have very pointy atoms in them, and your tongue is sensitive to that. And that's why it sort of stings. On the other hand, if you have some honey, 
honey turns out to be sweet. And the reason why honey is sweet when you put it on your tongue is because the atoms of honey are spherical and your tongue really likes it. So the idea then is that not is that they're working out a theory of nature, which is eventually going to end up creating a theory of perception and a theory of human nature. Um, but the, there's a whole collection of important things uh, feeding into this, right? And the first is, is the great battle between being and becoming, or more precisely, between uh, uh, Heraclitus and Parmenides. Um, you may have noticed that the world around you is changing. And you may have noticed that you're changing and uh, this change is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. And there's no way to get it to stop. For example, motion is a kind of change and it would be very difficult, I think, to force everything in the universe that's in motion to cease moving. So everything that's in motion is in a process of change. Okay, the problem that's going to, and what Heraclitus is going to say is that you can't uh, put your foot in the same river twice, which is actually a good point, right? I mean, the river of time, the river of experience flows on, and, uh, you know, none of us is going to get their virginity back, right? What's done is done. Uh, the words we say are like arrows. Once we let them go, they're gone. There's no way to recall them. Uh, the motions of the planets and the uh, other celestial bodies um, can't be replicated except in the short term. But over the long term, those orbits will degrade. So everything is under constant uh, flux. And that always entails the possibility of dissolution. Now, the problem that's going to emerge is that everything is always, is that if everything is always changing, then the sentence that everything is always changing itself is always changing. And what would be, what change could be born by the proposition that everything is constantly changing more thoroughly than nothing is ever changing? So what we have is uh, a line of thought, which while tempting, leads to self-contradiction and nonsense. Uh, it may be true that you can't put your foot, your foot in the same river twice, but it seems like you can't put your foot in the same river once because everything in the universe is completely unique. So uh, complete flux eats its own tail it ends up being self-destructive and self-contradictory, which gives us perhaps some hope that abolishing change and finding a way for things to be, and by this I mean to have stable characteristics that are unchanging, that are absolute, and what I mean by that is independent of space and time, things that just are and never undergo any change. Now, for uh, uh, some people, this will be a description of God. God doesn't undergo change because if he was perfect to begin with, any change would make him worse. And uh, the difficulties that came in in trying to conceptualize change and transformation by Heraclitus prompts a retort by Parmenides, a generation or so later. And Parmenides says, you must think and say that being is. And he writes a poem about the fact that being is. Now, that's a fascinating possibility that being is, because it would never have occurred to me to doubt that being is. Uh, if being wasn't, I don't know what that would mean, but it sounds like gibberish. And if being is, uh, I'm inclined to say that's true, but massively uninformative. Being is what? As Kant says much later on, being by itself is not a predicate, right? It's a copulative verb that allows you to get to the predicate. So um, Parmenides says being is, and what he means by that is that all the transformations in the world that you, that you encounter through your senses are 100% unreliable. There is no external world. And there also is no you.
Here's why. See, since being is, Parmenides thinks that only the one actually exists. And you may wonder what the one is. Uh, there's no easy way to translate this idea. Um, sometimes it works to drop in the, uh, as a synonym, everything. So Parmenides thinks that everything is. But if everything is, then it can't undergo any change or you end up with Heraclitus again, where you get universal change. And nobody knows how to mix together change and the absence of change, stasis, uh, because it seems like you're mixing uh, oil and water. So if, it, if anything exists, then everything has to be. And if everything is under uh, transformation, then everything has to become. And uh, it's hard to see how to bridge that. And uh, Heraclitus telling us that everything is becoming, uh, we must, uh, encounters his opposite, his bookend, the other parenthesis in Parmenides. He says, we must think and say that being is. So that means that there's only one thing, which is aptly named the one. It's not exactly everything because it's not a plurality it's one unified monolithic thing there is no plurality in it you can't this is in some ways like the inverse of the eye of the atom this is the thing that's too an atom is a thing too small to cut the one is a thing too big to cut why? Because there's nothing outside the one and if there's nothing outside the one then you can't get a knife on the outside to cut it it keeps receding and going on. It's infinitely large and infinitely small because neither largeness or smallness really exists. Oh, and by the way, uh, the people we're teaching these lessons to, uh, they don't exist either because they meld back into the one, two. That's just part of the illusion. I, giving this lecture, regrettably, that's an illusion as well. And so is Parmenides. So what he means is you can't trust your senses at all and if you can't trust your senses at all, uh, that's the only circumstance under which you can develop what Parmenides is really advocating here, which is logic or rationalism as opposed to empiricism, right? And while I don't want to eliminate uh, logic by any means, I, I mean, I think he's onto something important here. I, don't, I can't see Heraclitus or Parmenides as offering us the whole truth. Things do change, and they do remain the same, sort of. Explaining that or describing that is by no means easy. Taking the extreme position on either side, that everything's changing or that nothing's changing, very quickly leads to gibberish, right? Self-contradiction and nonsense. Now, that's actually a, a way of proceeding that Zeno, who was a, a, a close companion of Pythagoras, um, he made up a number of uh, paradoxes. And the idea was to show that motion, which everybody thought that existed, didn't make any sense. So if you know the, uh, the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise, right? There's fleet-footed Achilles and a tortoise, they're gonna run a race. Because he's magnanimous, Achilles lets, lets the tortoise go first, and lets, lets him uh, get a head start. Then, sometime after, Achilles begins running, he enters the race. And it takes him a given period of time to catch up to where the tortoise is when he starts. Right? That's the head tortoise's head start. But in that time, the tortoise has actually moved a little bit ahead of that. And now Achilles will have to make up that gap, but that will take some time. And however much time Achilles takes in making up the second gap, the tortoise will in that extra time have made it to a third gap. And Achilles will have to close the third gap and the tortoise will make it to a fourth. The idea is that logically Achilles never catches the tortoise, but in the real world of uh, space and time and sense perception, he seems to catch, to catch and then defeat the tortoise in the foot race. This was meant to show you that motion doesn't make any sense and isn't real. 
we're gonna the Greeks are a little too smart for their own good. We're gonna have to wait until uh we develop the idea of an infinitesimal, right? Which we'll get in the Enlightenment calculus, and then we'll be able to start solving problems like that. But uh the Greeks are better at producing problems that are solving them. Okay. Uh Pythagoras, one of my favorite, one of the most important figures we're going to study here. Um He's a pre-Socratic who concluded, and a mystic, who concluded that everything in the universe was made of numbers. Integers were secretly hidden inside the essence of the appearances we get, uh, we encounter through our senses. So he was walking by a blacksmith shop one day. He heard the blacksmith switch hammers, and he heard the different tones that were created when he hit different size hammers. And so we went in and examined the different hammers that he had. And he noticed that they had a peculiar ratio of weight to tone. So he concluded, and this is actually a great breakthrough, that secretly hidden in sound are numbers. Now he took that idea back home and then he put some, some strings under tension and he created different ratios in the length of the same string, a size string, and he got the same variation in tone. Again, he seems to find that mathematics, number, is secretly hidden inside everything we hear. Mathematics, then, is some kind of ethereal reality, somehow connected with divinity and magic. Remember that in the archaic world, everywhere, Mathematics and magic start out as the same discipline in the same way that astronomy and astrology start out as the same discipline. It's going to take a long time to separate them out. But when Pythagoras first figures out the theorem that's named after him, and it's been invented in many places, or it's been discovered in many places, not just the him, but he did apparently independently work it out. And as soon as Pythagoras worked out this amazing quality of right triangles, he went to the temple of Apollo and sacrificed an ox. Why? Because this comes from the gods. Mathematics is not like the ordinary tables and chairs that uh, furnish our world. Mathematics is, is separate and different. Reason why is that arithmetic turns out to be universal. And much of Greek epistemology is going to be organized around the question, how is it possible for arithmetic to be possible? In other words, we quarrel about everything, art and religion and politics and law and sex and uh, uh, human mind, but very few people have arguments about arithmetic. They may have disagreements, but those are easily and eventually soluble, and no one gets excited, no one screams at each other about that. The Greeks, understandably, were puzzled by that. Parmenides has an answer. Number is, re is everything. It's the ultimate reality. So he found a sort of monastic cult in Italy organized around this, uh, and he teaches the math, uh, particularly the theorem of Pythagoras, and uh, they have very strict ascetic rules, and uh, he pro Pythagoras probably visited both Mesopotamia and Egypt, and uh, he uh, had a sort of religious cult that worshipped number as the secret essence of everything. And uh, eventually, they tried to work out the right triangle, who, which, whose sides are one and one and the square root of two, right? We get that answer from uh, uh, the theorem of Pythagoras. So they start doing the division problem to find out what the square root of two is as a, a fraction. And uh, regrettably, it's uh, an irrational number. It doesn't end. This, of course, was terrifying and destructive to, to the ideas of Pythagoras. So instead of ab abandoning the idea that everything is number, since he couldn't find a number that corresponded to the square root of two, he just... Uh, swore his brotherhood to secrecy that no one was allowed to know about this 
Now it shows you something about the strange characteristics of mathematics uh, 2,500 years ago, that people thought it was possible, right? To keep math secret. <laughs> and uh, in the long run, of course, that's not possible. I mean, the uh, theorem of Pythagoras has been developed in many different places and times. We just happen to have it from this Pythagorean tradition. Now, in addition to Pythagoras's cult, there was a turn against religion that we got in Xenophanes. Xenophanes was a, a, a pre-Socratic philosopher, and he noticed that the religious traditions and religious images of different locations and different societies uh, made different uh, references and different descriptions of the gods. And he said that in Thrace, the gods have red hair. In Ethiopia, the gods have black skin. He said, if cows could make gods, they would have hooves and horns. The idea being that he's inventing cultural relativism. He, he notices empirically that there are lots of stories about the gods, and uh, they almost always line up with the people that tell them. Well, I mean, that's going to be destructive because it's going to make people wonder, well, then why should I follow the traditions and laws that I have? Uh, what makes them better or authoritative? And finally, we have Anaxagoras. He's a, a materialist at debunking astronomy. Astronomy is generally the last of the disciplines to have the gods and goddesses and spooks and spirits chased out. But he cuts to the chase and he says, the sun is a hot rock. Now, this is a problem for many reasons. First off, the sun is a deity, Apollo. It's Apollo's golden chariot that goes across the sky every day. And uh, Apollo, if you look back at book one of the uh, Iliad, might well take offense at that and send us a, an epidemic or something. Uh, second of all, it's uh, blasphemous because we all know that the stuff that's in the sky, like the moon and the stars, are celestial beings up in the heavens, and uh, they are superior to us, and we offer no, them, no disrespect because that can be a calamity. So uh, Anaxagoras brought out, uh, or brought out the implications of the scientific revolution. And what it means is this, uh, Apollo every day would rise in the east and set in the west. And Anaxagoras would say, does that look like a chariot to you? Doesn't look like that to me. But last night we had a very large fire and some of the stones became red hot and I saw them glow in the dark. And he said, well, it looks to me like that's much more likely to be a great big hot rock. And uh, I don't see why we tell the story about it being a golden chariot, because it doesn't look anything like that. And when this skepticism emerges, um, it turns out to be destructive of the polis. It creates a political and philosophical crisis. See, uh, the ancient Greeks didn't swear by the, on the Bible. It hadn't been written yet, and they didn't believe in it. Instead, they would swear... Uh, by the gods, especially Apollo and Zeus. Um, since they did this during the daytime in an open air area, uh, Apollo from his golden chariot could see that you were swearing an oath and he could tell if you were lying or telling the truth because he's a god. Now, it's like that Christmas carol. He knows if you, you know, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. The problem is that if you perjure yourself, at the end of the day, Apollo goes back to Father Zeus, tells Father Zeus who's been naughty, and schedules them to be hit with thunderbolts. Now, it doesn't matter whether that's actually real. What matters is whether people believe it or not. If they believe it, nobody or virtually nobody is going to take the risk of perjuring themselves. And what that means is you're actually going to have a functional legal judicial system. And there'll be a connection between politics and ethics. But once this demythologizing new science 
tells people that the sun is a hot rock, sooner or later it's going to dawn on a few sharper minds that uh, the sun doesn't care whether you tell the truth or not under oath because it's a hot rock and completely indifferent to your perjury. So what this means then is that people who are in the know, who understand the new world that's been created or discovered by pre-Socratic physics, are now going to st start applying these insights to the human sciences. And that's inevitably the result of a scientific revolution. They had no precedent for this. And as a result, everything else has to be rebuilt. They have to get rid of all their previous applications because this new science is like uh, an operating system. When you change the operating system, you have to change the apps, but you can change an app without the necessity of changing an operating system. That's how scientific revolutions work. You, If you have a scientific revolution, everything else gets changed, but you can change say religion or art or politics without gener uh, generating a corresponding scientific revolution. So it's only a one way. Okay. Um, so Anaxagoras demythologizes politics and law, and that's the beginning of the end for the polis. The reason why is that there's a group of men called sophists who have figured out how to apply this new demythologizing process to the human sciences. They claim to teach arete, which is virtue, and rhetoric. But what they mostly do is they teach you how to win. They teach you how to make the weaker argument appear strong, and they teach you how to get out from under the punishment which your bad conduct merits. So these are intelligent men, poorly educated, who have taken upon themselves to educate the youth of Athens and other cities. And they do it in exchange for big money, and they become very famous, very eminent in Greek society. Uh, there's a kind of predatory naturalism in them. The pre-Socratics are naturalistic. You know, it's just no spooks there. The sophists do something similar with politics and ethics. They cut it off from the myth and religious, mythic and religious tradition that had created it. And once that happens, the only sensible thing to do with politics and ethics uh, is to abolish the justice that came with uh, this early uh, mythic account. And instead, it's every man for himself. In other words, it sounds oftentimes like the sophists are inventing something new. I want to propose that they're not. I want to suggest that what they're doing is, is uh, exhorting us to fall backwards into PPP, the pure parad parasitic pre predator the pure predatory parasitism, sorry, of the very earliest stratified societies. Now, eventually those societies collapsed because uh, the elite made themselves hated with their lack of justice and their cruelty and their short-sightedness. And uh, while that is so, um, for societies to last more than a couple of generations, it's necessary to get the underclass on the side of the elite. And that means restraining the libido of the elite. And that's what these religious myths did. Now, once the Greek enlightenment has cut its way through these religious and poetic myths, the problem is if they, they need now something to substitute for it. And what the sophists are offering is a kind of amoralism. Big fish eat little fish. They don't have any qualms of conscience about it, nor should they. It's not reasonable to expect wolves to eat grass. And uh, the point is to be a human predator rather than human prey. This is, uh, I think, essential to the argument that Thrasymachus makes in the first book of the Republic, right? Justice is the advantage of the stronger. So whatever I want to do, rape or murder or theft or arson, um, if I'm stronger than the people I'm imposing this on, then that's completely just. And uh, what that is, is pure predator parasitism. 
Um, there's no reciprocity. There's no symbiosis. And uh, so in that sense, Thrasymachus is hearkening back to an ancient tradition. He's not, this is not something new. This has been a permanent human temptation as long as people could think about um, how to interact or the, the best way of interaction between the individual and society. So uh, Thrasymachus, and also if you get a look at it, Callicles in uh, the dialogue called the Gorgias, uh, he's quite Foucauldian. And uh, also uh, another uh, important sophist would be Gorgias himself. And uh, he's uh, as extreme as you can get. He's kind of Socrates inverted. He has three propositions. Consider this. The first thing he claims is that nothing exists, which is the inverse of Parmenides. And second, he says that even if anything exists, it can't be known. And even if anything exists, it can be known, it can't be communicated. What he's doing is just showing off how clever he is. And uh, what he's doing is showing that uh, he can do anything with words. Now, the reason why Socrates and Plato and Aristotle all decided at roughly the same time, sequential generations taken up about a century, the reason why they all decided among themselves, why don't we all get rational and start thinking deeply about uh, the nature of good and evil and criticizing myths in our own way, uh, and also criticizing science, which is well open to serious criticism. Um, they invented philosophy, not because they had, uh, they had a lot of free time. They invented philosophy because they didn't have any choice. The sophist interpretation of pre-Socratic physics as only offering mythic accounts of justice, which is a pretty good argument, they take it then that no argument for justice can be made except on the basis of poetic myths. And what that means is that that stuff is gone for good Serious thinkers in this new intellectual environment have to realize that it's all about winning. There aren't any rules. It's a rather uh, amoral Machiavellian view. But these early PPP thinkers, the pure pre uh, parasitic predators, um, they, uh, they were too short-sighted. And of course, they weren't able to read Machiavelli's prints, so they didn't know the maxim, uh, it's better to be feared than loved. They understood that part, but they didn't pick up on Machiavelli's addition, which is that it's absolutely essential not to make yourself hated. Because if people hate you, they will go out of their way to help your destruction, even if it harms them. Hatred is a very powerful motive. Now, Pure predator parasites, uh, who we see, say, at the beginning of Gilgamesh, uh, where Gilgamesh is raping the local women. Um, he has no reciprocity with the locals, and that means that, yes, there's a subterranean hatred that they don't dare express because they'll get killed. But what it means is that pure, uh, PPP regimes are unstable, Sooner or later, they break down. And when they do, you get a dark age after that. What's needed to, to stabilize these is the addition of a new idea, which is called justice. And justice is what allows, this religious conception, is what allows elites to self-regulate, allows them to draw back from the uh, most dangerous and incendiary of the libido of the libidinous desires right in other words don't abuse the people you depend on excessively anyway if you do your regime will die if you don't they will side with you when the regime is under stress and what that means is that uh, um, justice turns out to be very functional and injustice is both radical, but it ultimately leads to a, a, a response that's destructive. It doesn't, it's ephemeral, it doesn't last very long. So 
now that the old myths have collapsed and the old standards of justice have, have collapsed, Socrates is going to try to create an account of justice which is purely rational, which does not uh, reflect revelation and also does not reflect uh, uh, poetic myths. Socrates wants uh, to climb the, la the logical ladder to heaven. Now, it, that's a very Greek thing to do, all right, to try and, I mean, that's what Prometheus did when he climbed uh, uh, the sacred mountain of the gods, and uh, he brought down to us fire, and that's the real Greek idea. And so uh, the sophists, like the pre-Socratic physicists, are revolutionaries, and Socrates is trying not to abolish the revolution, because look, the intellectual revolution is a given. There's nothing anybody can do about that. Instead, what he's trying to, what Socrates is trying to do, and what Plato is turning into a, a written corpus, uh, is to give a rational account of human nature, of human society, of politics, and of ethics, and of psychology. In other words, all of the human society, uh, all of the humanities, including the arts, um, are going to be reformulated uh, under the weight of Socratic criticism. And that's going to be formulated and given its ultimate uh, structure by Plato. And the greatest of the Platonic dialogues is Plato's Republic. Now, we're looking at the first book of Plato's Republic for today. And uh, the best I can tell you with regard to this is that this is focused on uh, symbolism, which will be easier to understand once we have read the book once already, which is why I say that you have to read it more than once to read it the first time. And... Uh, also, this is going to be the part of the book that is devoted to aliens, to people that are not citizens. The only citizen important in the talking in the first in the first book is Socrates himself. Uh, Thrasymachus is a sophist known for the proposition that justice is the advantage of the stronger, which is PPP. And uh, Cephalus, whose name means head, head of the household, I guess, uh, old gray head. Um, this is his house that they've been brought to. And his son, Polemarchus, whose name means war leader, is also a medic. So his father, uh, Cephalus, and Polemarchus' son, they're both uh, something like resident aliens, right? So they don't, they're not citizens, but they're allowed to stay. And uh, Cephalus made a big killing in the armaments industry. He brought slaves and raw material. He had them create shields and spears and arrowheads and such, and uh, made a lot of money because during the Peloponnesian War, there was a very considerable amount of demand for weapons. So here's someone getting rich in Athens, and his son is a product of Athens because he's been living there, you know, most of his life or almost all of his life. And uh, finally, we get Thrasymachus, who's described as the beast of discourse. He's uh, analogized to a lion and to a wolf, and uh, he is a, a rhetorical predator. And he has come to Athens to seek noble young men that can pay big money to study with him. And so the main portion of the dialogue uh, is devoted to Thrasymachus. The two earlier parts are in some ways like comic relief. Uh, the main themes are st stated on the first page, uh, the disjunction between knowledge and power, right? There's only one of Socrates, there's a dozen of these guys, and Socrates, and they say, look, either prove stronger than all of us, or you have to come with us. And he says, yeah, I guess you're right. This is the, uh, well, he doesn't actually say it, but implicitly, this is the <laughs> dilemma of the 
philosopher in the democratic city. Uh, he knows what's going on. They don't, but they have the power. Uh, so they demand that he comes with them, but he asks, well, could I persuade you to let us go? And one of them, I think it's, uh, who, who is it? Oh, damn, I forget. Uh, one of the, the group, uh, it says, uh, could you persuade us if we won't listen to you? And Socrates says, well, no, you got a point there. But now we see why Socrates doesn't bother to talk to these people. They demand that he comes by force down to talk to them. But before the discussion begins, they promise that they're not going to listen. So this is why Socrates is kind of washed his hands and say, I, I don't want to go down the low road towards Piraeus. Glaucon and I were going up the high road. We were climbing upward. And Glaucon is the interlocutor that's going to be most closely associated with Socrates. Socrates actually wanted his company without the rest of these jokers. Okay. There's a, a very funny high comedy in uh, Cephalus' reception of Socrates. You have to remember that Cephalus is filthy rich, and uh, he's, uh, he's generally led an immoral life. In order to get contracts, you pay some bribes. You take the extra money you make, you spend it in a brothel or buying some sort of luxury or uh, drinking yourself senseless. Uh, Kephalus was, uh, how can I put this, uh, a man driven by his appetites. And the reason why is that he got a bad education. He's been educated by the poets like Homer, and he's been taught that you can bribe the gods if you give them enough sacrifices so they don't send you to your well-merited punishment in the afterlife. Now, you can't imagine a more, a more drastically dysfunctional myth than that. When they arrive, he's been sacrificing away. When, they, when he goes back to, to the sacrifices, he's well-employed. Uh, and this gives people a reason to behave badly because they think that if they live long enough and they get rich enough, they can sacrifice a whole bunch of livestock and get off. Uh, and so Socrates asks him, and you have to remember that Socrates is an old man like Cephalus. So uh, how do you like being old, Cephalus? Is that, uh, what do you have to tell us about it? Now, the joke being that Socrates perfect, knows perfectly well, and Cephalus' response is, well, it's no fun at all. It's really not a good thing to be old, but you can't avoid it. But the thing that's most important that I found out is that the only thing that makes old age bearable is lots and lots of money. Uh, I can do all the sacrifice that I need to do. I mean, I got a whole flock of animals out there. I'm killing away. I get all, so I get to have a, a good time and then I get an out of Hades free card because I have the cash. Without that, I'd be really worried. You know, old age would be just about unbearable. Now you have to remember Socrates has no money at all. Right, he doesn't find old age unbearable. He doesn't think he can bribe the gods. He thinks it's an unworthy view of the gods, and uh, he's not anxious about the afterlife. Remember that when a sophist teaches a student, it, it's for the sophist benefit. He charges a wage, big, big, uh, a big uh, check. When Socrates teaches someone, it's for the student's benefit, and he doesn't charge anything. Right. So uh, Socrates uh, has this comic relief discussion with Cephalus and says, that's a good point, Cephalus. If you, you know, an, uh, an old guy like me, it has no money. It's absolutely unbearable. I think it's about time you go sacrifice some more bulls and chickens and stuff. You're well employed doing that. And then Polemarchus, his son, you have to think a teenager who's very free and equal with both citizens and non-citizens, slaves and free, and old and young, male and female. In other words, um, having been brought up in Athens, uh, Polemarchus is uh, someone who's used to a great deal, perhaps an excessive amount of liberty, and also equality. Here we have one of the great thinkers in the world. He's uh, an old man with a gray beard. Uh, he asks, of a kid, <clears throat> high school age, what's justice, young man? And he says, oh, that's easy. Everybody knows that. 
And so, number one, he's been miseducated because it's not easy, and everyone does not know that. And the answer he gives is just uh, a quoting of Simonides, a poet. And Socrates was thinking, oh, well, this is what happened to his father. This is what's going to happen to the son, too. Uh, the miseducation by the poets is a very dangerous thing. And Simonides, the poet says, you sh the justice is uh, helping friends and harming enemies. Uh, it takes Socrates uh, two pages or so to show that that's nonsense, that the good man does no one any harm. That's one of the great pinnacles of Socratic uh, rhetoric and, and dialectic. But he's gentle with the boy because the boy doesn't have enough wit to be a problem. Uh, and he also says, or, or, or the argument that Simonides is making is strangely like, uh, like that of Carl Schmitt, the Nazi political theorist who makes a fundamental distinction between friends and enemies. That's hearkening back to a very ancient archaic tradition as well. Universalistic moral rules, as you get with uh, uh, Socrates or Kant, um, does not assume that. It assumes that a la mention Um So finally, uh, we're going to get Polemarchus quieted down, and then the beast of discourse, Thrasymachus comes in, and he says that justice is the advantage of the stronger. Socrates points out that lots of strong people are stupid, and when they give an order, it often turns out to be detrimental to their real interest, because um, if you don't know what's going on, you could easily uh, give an order that's harmful to you. And of course, that's true. So then Thrasymachus amends it and says, uh, the stronger has to know what's best for him. And uh, if that's the case, then what he legislates is the advantage of the stronger. But Socrates shows that every art actually serves the thing that it's, that it's the ruler of. So uh, uh, livestock keeping is practiced by a shepherd and he's not looking for his benefit he's looking for the benefit of the sheep he'll get paid later on uh same sort of thing with doctors doctors don't want to get the better of other doctors they want to get the better of diseases so socrates says the just man only wants to get the better of the unjust man and that's only because it's in both of their interest to, to relieve the unjust man of the burden of messing up his life and everybody else's on the other hand the unjust man wants to get the better of everybody including the just man and of course that ends up hurting him as well as everybody else the point being this socrates is throwing some very dubious arguments at Thrasymachus, but Thrasymachus can't think on his feet. He's a he's a rhetorician, not a dialectician. He is not good at that sharp cut and thrust. So uh, Socrates silences him without really refuting him. And uh, that's the point. That's the idea. Um, Thrasymachus, who has been trying to, to uh, get honor in this intellectual agon, this intellectual fight between heroes, um, instead of getting kudos, instead of getting glory, he gets ignominy. Socrates beats him out of camp like Thersites. Uh, Socrates doesn't need real intellectual weapons. He wouldn't bother with a sword. He can get a, a, a knotted cord and beat him ferociously and dishonor him. That's why Thrasymachus blushes at that critical juncture in the first book, he realizes that he's been exposed. He realizes that he's self-contradictory. He realizes that Socrates is finishing him. And then he becomes balky and asks stupid stuff like, do you have a wet nurse and stuff like that? Now, the point is this. Socrates wants to dispatch the non-citizens so that he can have a serious discussion among citizens, which is where a discussion of justice is properly located. It seems that many uh, objectionable things have entered Athens through its commerce in people and ideas. So uh, the connection between citizenship and justice is going to have to be considered and examined.
The next two uh, interlocutors, Adamantus and Glaucon, are uh, Plato's brothers. Glaucon, who is, they say, most brave in all things, uh, was with Socrates to begin with. Socrates wants his comedy. On the other hand, Adamantus was, was with Cephalus and uh, the rest of the lads, uh, and he's been keeping bad company, apparently. So this is Socrates' chance to bring him out of the bad company and into a more refined and more moral and more wholesome circle made up of three citizens rather than a heterogeneous mix of everybody that we can find. All right. For now, all right, let's stop here. I'm going to cut off and uh, let's talk a little bit later about how this works. Okay.